podcast. I'm your host, Michael Lange, and this is Oakland Is. Haiti has been in the news recently, uh, not so much even for the recent earthquake, but a lot of the uh, political uh, climate in that particular part of the world uh, has requested that we find out what is going on, what issues uh, face Haiti at this present time. With me uh, back again is Mr. Pierre Laboisier, uh, Mr. Walter Riley, who is with the Haiti Emergency Relief uh, Fund, and also Marilyn Langlois, who is also with the Emergency Relief, uh, Relief Fund, and also with the city of uh, Richmond uh, from the mayor's office as a community uh, activist. I want to welcome all of you to our program. Thank, Thank you, you. Michael. You know, Thank uh, you. the issues facing Haiti, <clears throat> we heard about this incredible uh, bad news where over 300,000 people perished uh, due to an earthquake. And uh, mo most recently in the news, of course, uh, Baby Doc is uh, returning, uh, trying to return to, to Haiti uh, after 25 years of absence. And so there's some issues that are facing uh, us in this country that uh, this country is also uh, positioning itself, uh, I imagine, from the political uh, elected officials as well as from the citizens. And we certainly need to find out what we can do as citizens to make sure that Haiti is safe. Uh, and that we take care of the business at hand. So I want to uh, welcome all of you to the program. And I wanted to start with you, uh, Pierre. Uh, this recent event uh, of the earthquake, I mean, how devastating um, uh, were you uh, by its event happening? Like, um, first of all, I want to say thank you very much. For returning. And I to want to mm -hmm. thank the, the audience and people in the Bay Area, people throughout the, this throughout the U.S. Okay. and the world, really, for coming to, uh, for demonstrating their solidarity with the people of Haiti in the great hours of need. And uh, the people of Haiti, many of the grassroots organizers, people from various communities who we work with, I'm a member of the Haiti Emergency Relief Fund, they have asked me to express their many, many, many thanks okay. from the bottom of their heart because they know also that conditions aren't that great here, that many people in the U.S. are using, losing their homes, their jobs, but to see so many people just come out of this outpouring of love and sending them funds and helping them out, it really touched them deeply. So, uh, so thank you once again. Mm -hmm. But um, it was really devastating to all of us too the people in Haiti who many lost their lives, the numbers were upgraded uh, just three weeks ago to about 310,000. And there are still some buildings that where they don't know how many people perished. And so at first I didn't want to believe it when I heard the news, because I'm used to, we are used to hurricanes there, but not an earthquake. And so there were many cities that were devastated, not just Port-au-Prince. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a number of cities along the southern coast, southern peninsula that were devastated as well. I believe about seven or so small towns and large cities that were devastated. And uh, so it's really a, a terrible thing. But what shocks us was the slow response. I mean, everyone has, has uh, mentioned that the slow response or the no response at all. And now we are one year after the quake, and still people are not living, not even tents. They are living under uh, shelters made of shredded pieces of plastic and bed sheets, and living in the mud and exposed to all the elements. This, this is abominable. Yeah. This is shameful, outrageous, given all the amounts of, of uh, monies that were collected supposedly to be distributed among the people in need. Yeah. Usually the, uh, uh, the politics will happen around the distribution of the money and funds and blankets and things like that. Now, now Walter, you were physically in Haiti when this uh, earthquake <coughs> occurred. What was your situation? What was your experience? Yeah, I was there a quarter of 12 on January 12th, quarter of uh, five mm -hmm. on January 12th mm -hmm. when the uh, earth started to shake and rubble fell on people, buildings tumbled. Mm -hmm. um, the tremendous cries of, of um, you hurt. You kind of see your, your life kind of flashing in front of you, I imagine. Well, you, uh, <clears throat> when 
things happen, you know, I guess you can respond at the time. Um, if you have a moment to reflect, you can realize how horrible it is, what the dangers are. But yes, we realized it was very dangerous at the time. Mm -hmm. What was more uh, significant, at that m time, immediately, when we were outside, uh, realizing that uh, we were safe, um, we started to talk. And I was aware of the uh, slow response to mm -hmm. New Orleans. And I, at the time, it became some concern. Would there be the same kind of slow response? Yeah. Yes, it would be because mm -hmm. of it, it was Haiti. It was this place in this hemisphere where the international powers have not responded to the needs of Haiti. We knew what happened in the hurricane uh, before that in 2006. There was not the response to help and save the people of Haiti. Um, the Haitian government was not responding to the needs of the people of Haiti, and there was not that force in the international community to make those things happen. People were building and organizing for themselves. So. Um, immediately after the earthquake. These were things that people were dealing with, and I'm sure I was not the only one in that country of nine million people that yeah. was aware of what happened in New Orleans and that also knew mm -hmm. what the history has been with Haiti. Wow, so there was a, a definitely a pattern uh, that seems to follow. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's ironic that uh, the, the, you know, New Orleans uh, situation has a lot of people of color, you know, in it, and uh, so there, therefore it doesn't seem like with speed, deliberate speed, or even with faster than deliberate speed, that the resources would get there, and then this thing happens in, in Haiti. And the people look a lot the same. Wow, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Marilyn, you, now you're working with the Emergency Relief yes. uh, Fund for Haiti, and um, how, to tell me the history of your involvement with uh, this particular part of the world and why right. you are engaged in this activity. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thanks for having a program on this topic. It's very important. Mm -hmm. um, I, I never really knew a lot about Haiti growing up. I'd, I'd, I'd heard about it here and there. My parents even traveled there in the 50s as tourists. Um, but um, as I grew more into my adulthood and beyond, um, I'd, I'd hear things that just didn't make a lot of sense. I heard contradictory things in the media. You'd, you know, you'd hear about the Duvalier regimes that were yeah. terrible and brutal and this and that. And then you'd hear about Aristide, who, became, who was first elected in 1990, and again in 2000, and there was a coup in 91. I mean, I wasn't following the stories closely, but all I knew was that something wasn't making sense about what I was hearing in the mainstream media. And finally, at a uh, later time in my life, very shortly before the um, coup of 2004, okay. I thought, no, this is the bicentennial year. It actually shocked me that January 1st, 2004 was not a major celebration around the world. Yeah. Um, I thought, why isn't this happening? And um, got um, interested in learning more about Haiti. I've read Paul Farmer's book, The Uses of Haiti, which is a, a good background document. Somebody said, you've got to meet Pierre Labossiere, yes. which I did. I got involved with the Haiti Action Committee, traveled to Haiti a couple of times, and got involved with the Haiti Emergency Relief Fund, because I see this as really, really ground zero for um, the um, um, whole struggle for liberation around the sure. world. Sure, we're talking about humanity. Yes. And uh, we, we have to find ways to transcend uh, uh, the labels that we put on people, uh, whether it's um, an issue of diversity or ethnicity or cultural, to, yeah. to get to the core of, of hope and of, right. of helping uh, people in need. I wanted to ask, ask you up here, you know, because there's this just seems to be this, this event of 200 years ago, the independence of, of Haiti, and I, I, can you give me a, a briefing on this? This was a battle that took place, and uh, I remember the names uh, Christophe, Henry, Henry Christophe, Christophe Dessalines, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, and Toussaint. Toussaint Louverture. And I know that they were all contemporaries of each other around That's 18... Right. Um, 1791 okay. through... 1804. So this is where the story begins, or at least the independence. Ooh, and uh, are you saying that after 200 years, which should be a celebration, right. that, uh, that people didn't, didn't want to celebrate this? And it, it, it feels, it looks like it's because of certain reasons, I imagine. Yes, and it was a, it was a great struggle because our African 
foremothers and forefathers had been kidnapped from Africa and brought uh, to the land that we now know as Haiti, okay. but in the past it was known as Saint-Domingue when it was ruled by the French. Uh -huh. The original name was Haiti, Haiti. It was okay. the original Haiti. indigenous name okay. by the Tainos and the Arawaks native uh, people who inhabited it before they were wiped out by Christopher Columbus. Mm -hmm. He actually exterminated most of them, the great majority. So the Africans were under brutal system of slavery and that's what made it the richest colony in the Americas, richer than the 13 colonies uh, of the continental United States. And so um, people who are oppressed will rise up. Mm -hmm. And so the Africans had been so oppressed that they were rising up. And finally, 1791 was the big uprising mm -hmm. led by Bookman Dotti. And, um, and after 13 years of war, and to, in which Toussaint Louverture was a brilliant military yes. genius, and Jean-Jacques Dessalines and Henry Christophe, his lieutenants, mm -hmm. uh, Toussaint Louverture was kidnapped and died of starvation in the French jail, but uh, Dessalines and Christophe and Pétion continued the struggle mm -hmm. until 1804, Haiti became a free and independent nation. Mm -hmm. And the Africans, they were from very many parts of Africa, mm -hmm. they called themselves in honor of the original indigenous yeah. people, they named the land Haiti, Haiti. or Haiti. Yes. And so uh, the, it means land of mountains. And uh, so Haiti became a symbol that had to be destroyed because at that time all around this slavery was in full swing. Yes. And so um, Haiti became that symbol that had to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. So US policy, the young United States had slavery mm -hmm you know, was a slave owning, was a slave nation. Yes. And so Haiti was a bad example. But the impact on Africans here in the U.S. under slavery was they were elated. And many communities started calling themselves Haiti, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. was the original name, name. pronunciation of Haiti, mm -hmm. Haiti. Mm -hmm. and My community. Yeah. In Durham, North Carolina. Yeah. Now, you're from North Carolina, right? Yes, <laughs> Durham, Durham, North Carolina. Wow. <clears throat> and the mm -hmm. section in uh, Durham, uh, that was, the black community was called Haiti. Wow. So, uh, Haiti, yeah. we called it. Haiti, uh, yeah. Haiti. <laughs> Yeah, so, so you have this uh, you, you, legacy, this tremendous, uh, I mean, how did the uh, Haitians, how did they win? I mean, they were fighting against uh, the Napoleon? Time? Yes, against the forces of Napoleon and also against the British and the Spanish as well. And they successfully defeated each and every one of those armies yeah. until they declared themselves independent. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you fight different when you're fighting from your home base. I mean, you're fighting Indeed. as opposed to being an occupying force going someplace. You don't have the same angle as somebody that's protecting their home. I mean, you, the, the fight is different. That's right. And, 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 and we've been able to, to, to see this, uh, but we have to transcend uh, because particularly these uh, uh, disasters that have hit Haiti. Now, I know that it's in that corridor where you get a lot of hurricanes. That's cool. But this earthquake... Uh, really uh, created uh, major, a major uh, horrendous activity that, that, that we still can support. I want to know how can we as an audience support what you're doing in Haiti? Okay. Maybe you might want to address Sure. Thank that. you very much for that question. And I, I'd like to also just make a little distinction between uh, the work of the Haiti Emergency Relief Fund okay. and some of the major aid organizations um, that are out there, offices, the, uh, you know, the Red Cross, the Bush Clinton okay. Fund, and that kind of thing. Okay. People were so generous after the earthquake. From all corners, people gave so much money. But the major aid organizations have been sitting on most of that money. Uh, because of uh, decisions being made at the highest levels in the U.S. government that we can talk yeah. about separately. Yeah. But our organization, we uh, believe in solidarity and not charity. It's a very important mm -hmm. distinction. We also work directly with our Haitian partners. We have no overhead. We have a board of five people, the three of us and two more. We're all volunteers. Wow. We have a few additional volunteers that help us with a few tasks. All of the money that we collect has gone directly to our partners in Haiti. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's fun, right after the earthquake, we funded some of the immediate survival needs for food, water, 
uh, tarps and tents and that sort of thing. And then we asked our Haitian partners, what do you need? We didn't say, oh, we're going to give you money for this or that. We asked them what they need, and they told us they want to have their kids starting to go to school. So we funded mobile schools projects, and those are ongoing. We need some more clinics. We help get medical supplies and medical teams there. Um, they needed mental health assistance. You know, this earthquake was incredibly damaging also emotionally and psychologically. Uh, people were traumatized from that. So we set up a lay mental health program that's been very successful. And then we've also, um, f to make uh, sustainable um, uh, assistance for sustainable businesses, some of the women's groups there, and I, I have to say there's incredible women's organizing in Haiti, lots of great grassroots groups. They wanted a small amount of funds so that they could set up their own microcredit programs right. that they would run themselves. And they've done that and been very successful. So we would encourage encourage um, anyone who is interested and who cares to donate to the Haiti Emergency Relief Fund, and I think you'll show the information yeah, we'll show for the that. Informa I wanted to ask Walter, uh, I mean, how do, how do you feel knowing that something that you're putting your uh, uh, talent and time and labor into is reaching people, saving lives? Well, I mean, it <clears throat> makes a great deal of difference in terms of how I feel about what I do, and I think it's true for all of us, and the Haiti Emergency Relief Fund. But it's also true for the people who have given support to what we do in the Haiti Emergency Relief Fund. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I like to just always say that the Bay Area has been instrumental in helping to support popular movements all over the world. Whether we're talking about the anti-apartheid fight in South Africa yeah. from the 60s at sure. the time we were aware of what was going on in Central America, mm -hmm. uh, our support to the region when popular movements exist. We have always yeah. been part always, of that in the Bay always. Area. And, and you've been part of that for mm -hmm. so long, mm -hmm. and, and I know that's part of the politics yeah. of your life and, and, and what you do. It's important that we understand that. The Haiti Emergency Relief Fund is more than just an organization that gives money so that people can go to school. Though going to school is important for the kids who never had an opportunity to go to school before, because many of the people we work with go out and recruit the kids who don't have that opportunity. Yeah. Since President Aristide was kidnapped, there's these folks who don't get any support from the government, mm -hmm. who don't get any support from the uh, public school system, who don't get the medical care and medical help. It's important that we have those medical facilities that we support. It's important that we help those schools. It's important that we get the clean water programs, the agricultural programs that we are involved with, uh, giving seeds to people in rural communities, the silos so that farmers can store food, transportation yeah. that we give through our financial aid so they can get the the uh, products to market, um, uh, the, uh, the entire aspect of our work and all the structures that we help to support. And we support people all over the country. But something that you might appreciate is that what's most important is that we give support to the popular movement yeah. mm -hmm. you know, in mm -hmm. Haiti. Mm -hmm. The popular movement folks in Haiti do not get support from the major NGOs or the major governments. Yeah. When these disasters occur, uh, there's a whole study of disaster capitalism, uh, how um, individuals and corporations go into places to make the maximum profit or to change things. Yeah. Uh, some of the things that people will relate to is that in New Orleans, it was an opportunity for people to say, let's get rid of all these yeah. high rises where black people are living uh, or poor people are living, or let's change the yeah. structure of these community organizations. Let's change the educational system is one of the things they started in New Orleans. Well, that same kind of approach uh, occurs in Haiti. Uh, where there is an opportunity to get rid of yeah. community organizations that are trying to make change for the community, for the people that are around mm -hmm. there. Um, right. So they go in to build factories to give people a dollar uh, a day or three dollars mm -hmm. a day where they can't really live when it costs two dollars and fifty cents or so to get yeah. to work. Um, mm -hmm. They do all of that. What we do and what we talk about a lot and we want people to know, and I think yeah. it's important, yeah. it that is. this is our support mm -hmm. for schools, for water programs, for clean water, for medicine, all yeah. of that we do. But we do that with people who are part of the popular movement mm -hmm. because they get starved out mm -hmm. from other folks. People that we work with, many, some of the organizations don't get a dime from anybody. And if we didn't give our support yeah. to them, they wouldn't survive. Sure. There can be no liberation struggle unless people have support Mm -hmm. within their own communities mm -hmm. and right now because of the globalization of everything yep. including liberation 
there can be no liberation struggle without support from people around the world. Yeah. And that's what we are part of. Mm -hmm. So our money goes to that. Yeah. That's a really, and that feels good. Sure. That Everybody we know that we've been able to talk about it, figure out what we need to do, mm -hmm. and go out and ask people, mm -hmm. let's make sure that we can give money to people so that they can get up in the morning and have the energy and yeah. spirit to go out and build demonstrations, to build campaigns, to change government, to change their communities, yeah. to demand clean water, to demand that there be uh, some cleaning of the streets. That's what we're doing, Michael. Yeah. yeah. And that's where our money goes. But, but you know, it also feels that the, uh, the uh, forces of evil are also operating and laying obstacles in your path. One is to put the brakes on, Absolutely. slow this down. Um, and, you know, let's just take Aristide, for example, and, right. and baby, right. baby Doc uh, Devalier, mm -hmm. who wants to, after 25 years, come back. I wanted to, can you give me a briefing, uh, Pierre, on Aristide? His situation, um, what happened, uh, he was duly elected. Duly elected twice. Right. He was elected on a platform of doing, uh, to a platform, a program that the people throughout the country had put together. And actually there is a book that, that, that has the platform and, and the, the wow. program of the Lavalas, Eyes of the Heart, here? is one of the books that he, wow. that he wrote. But um, this book is in French, it's called Investir dans l'humain, Investing in People. Uh -huh. And it Investing. was actually, it's the plan that from Lavalas, the, polit the political party of President Aristide, had in terms of uh, providing for people, using the resources of the country, to provide schools, sources of clean water, tools for the peasant farmers, uh, hospitals for people, healthcare. In other words, to make life livable for mm -hmm. the majority of the people. For the first time, yeah. he told people exactly where the mineral resources were, that Haiti has gold, copper, oil, uranium, you can uh, see the future. marble. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and he, he put all that. Before that, I didn't know any of that stuff existed, mm -hmm. you see? So that was a program put together by the people. This, is, this book, mm -hmm. Eyes of the Heart, talks about where the poor are seeking a path for the poor in the age of globalization. That's the subtitle. So that tells yeah. you right there. And when uh, President Clinton, Bill Clinton, was pushing globalization and NAFTA, President Aristide was saying, that's not good for us. It won't help us out. Mm -hmm. It's going mm -hmm. to create more misery for us. Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, the big people in this world don't appreciate when you tell them the truth. Yeah. This book I highly recommend by Randall Robinson. It's oh, a history yes. of Haiti mm -hmm. and it's called An Unbroken Agony and it's uh, Haiti from revolution to the kidnapping of a okay. president. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this, this is, is an unbroken agony. I mean it just captures the, exactly. the essence of what has happened. And the photograph is very, the photograph was taken on mm -hmm. January 1st, 2004, that ah. Marilyn was talking about, yeah. right in front of the National Palace. Yeah. The people of Haiti were demonstrating. These are shackles, actually, from the days of slavery. Yeah. And out of it, out of the broken shackles, mm -hmm. they had the Haitian flag rising. Mm -hmm. So yeah. very sim symbolic. And uh, there was, uh, actually, it was sabotaged. The people of Haiti turned out en masse to celebrate mm -hmm. the bicentennial. But worldwide, right. you know, you had France, the U.S., Canada, mm -hmm. and other European, uh, yeah. Western European countries, and other countries as well that were doing the bidding of those big powers, decided that Haiti's bicentennial, the 200-year anniversary yeah. of the independence, was not something to be celebrated. Wow. So they, they misrepresented it mm -hmm. throughout the world. The New York Times particularly did yeah. a hatchet job where it said there was a small but enthusiastic crowd. Mm -hmm. So our organization, Haiti Action Committee, published a, a photo of the huge crowd that was wow. out there to show how much the yeah. New York Times was yeah. lying yeah. about uh, mm -hmm. its, its miss, about the, the way it represented the mm -hmm. event that yeah. day. I, I was there. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, we only have a few minutes left, but I wanted to um, just briefly talk about Frederick Douglass, um, he said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. <laughs> and he also was an ambassador at one point, yes. I think in the 1895 or so, mm -hmm. uh, to Haiti. Uh, but you know, it looks like there's gonna be a struggle. I mean, the the yes. struggle that, that we've gone through, the have versus the have nots, it's, it's now different. It's not just former slaves 
uh, and the mentality of the last 200 years for African Americans just in this country. Mm -hmm. But as we look around the world, it's starting to become the have and the have-nots, and people right. being marginalized, people squashing things. And so here we have a, a baby doc. I mean, what is his r reason? Uh, I mean, how does he come back uh, to Haiti as, as a potential president? Can you respond to that? Yes, uh, it's, it's shameful, it's mm -hmm. disgusting, particularly to hear the State Department telling when the people of Haiti are demanding the return of President Aristide, yeah. mm -hmm. the State yeah. Department is saying, oh, they should be looking yeah. towards the, the future and not the past. But, but, they, yeah, but they look at, at but baby dark. The future they want from ha for Haiti yeah. is the ugly past yes. of the right. dictators, yeah. of fraudulent right. elections mm -hmm. like the one they just did in Haiti, mm -hmm. that when I say they, I mean the United Nations, the U.S., France, and Canada who now occupy Haiti. Yeah. They set up fraudulent elections and this is what the Haitian people are rejecting. Yeah. So Aristide was elected twice overwhelmingly mm -hmm. because he represents the future, yeah. which is a future of clean elections, right. a future of schools for people, mm -hmm. for food for people, decent employment for mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. so that our peasant farmers can have the right tools, the seeds in order to plant and grow food that the Haitian people yeah. can eat. Yeah. So in short, to develop right. the country mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. the benefit of the many yeah. and right. not uh, the way the U.S. State Department has supported the dictators of the past. Mm -hmm. And that's why Baby Doc was brought back in, yeah. to bring back the, this bad, strong man who's going to keep the people in check yeah. and, and keep us on the plantation. Wow. No, the people of Haiti are rejecting yes. this. Yes. Right. And we are calling for the return of President Aristide yes. to help us rebuild the country, develop the country, right. and mobilize the forces of the country too, so okay. that we can have a better life. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank you for the uh, half hour. It went very quickly, as you can see. And, uh, I just want to say that uh, let's hope that the struggle uh, continues, that we uh, continue to get the food and the services uh, to a much needed part of the world to Haiti. And there are ways that you can help us. Uh, you can uh, make a direct donation. Uh, there is an address and a website uh, that you can give your money and give, uh, give until you can feel it, because I want to know what your heart aches for. And uh, our heart is aching in Haiti right now, and you can help us resolve that. So thank you very much for coming on the program. So long thank until next much. week.